Hey guys, welcome to The Disruptors. You know the show. We get the world's coolest people and we talk about where it's headed. Today we're doing it. We got Richard Witt. Thanks for coming today, Richard. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate being here. So I love that kind of your title, the way that people, or at least most people, would refer to someone like you would be a Googler, an ex-Googler. And that's kind of like a thing now. Why is that a thing? Why is that, <laughs> a, why is that a badge of honor? Well... I'd like to think it's a badge of honor, even in, in you know, the recent months and years when the company's been coming under some in, increasing pressures, let's say, from some of its uh, activities on the web. But you know, Google has prided itself on, on hiring some of the best and brightest. I was very fortunate. I joined the company back in early 2007 um, in the days when they were trying to figure out network neutrality as an issue. And I'd come from the telecom space, but also with a long background doing internet policy, uh, online policy, even back in the late 80s. So, I seem to be a good fit for them in their DC office. And yeah, over the years, I mean, it just, it has been a badge of honor to have, to say you had worked at Google, that you, uh, you know, were part of uh, what was really the, the, the most transformative platform of the, of the early 21st century, I would say, uh, even as Facebook came along. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm proud to wear that badge, um, even through some of the more turbulent times the company's been going through recently. At least it's not Facebook, right? So net, net neutrality, <laughs> net neutrality. I definitely wanted to dive into that. Why is net neutrality not dead obvious? Why is there even any kind of question or debate here? Outline net neutrality quickly for people who don't know. Well, you know, part of it depends upon how you define net neutrality, right? And, you know, back in 2002, uh, Tim Wu wrote sort of the seminal paper where he described the concerns about when um, broadband providers had the power to control the packets of information flowing back and forth between end users and the web. Um, and I think he, he appropriately pointed out that the, the incentives for discrimination were very strong there. Uh, and I think over the years, we've gone back and forth and the large telephone companies and cable companies, of course, had many resources and lots of friends in DC. Um, and also the political winds shifting between Democratic and then Republican administrations. And unfortunately, it became a political issue. Uh, I'd like to think it's a fairly straightforward common sense issue, but uh, the Republicans, uh, for their own reasons, decided this was something that they wanted to support on behalf of the cable and telcos to try to kill it off through various means. Um, the definition really comes down to, you know, should the broadband providers be able to mess around with your bits? <laughs> um, I'd like to think no. I think most people, most Americans, really most folks in, uh, who, who we polled, whether in the US or in Europe or even in Asia, uh, have a similar, fairly strong 60, 70 plus percent support in net neutrality. What it really comes down to is past the blocking and degrading of the bits, this notion of whether or not we should have packets prioritized. Um, and that gets a little, little more dicey because then the question is, you know, are there certain forms of traffic if the end user, for example, decides they want to have their broadband platform be just totally uh, limited to, to high-end gaming, can they make that decision on their behalf uh, to do that? Um, or, you know, then the next piece of that is then they, could a cable company or telephone company they make that decision for them? And, you know, it starts to get a little bit more into, or into business models. And, you know, if you're prioritizing some traffic, does that mean you're creating other traffic? So it, at that point, it gets, it gets fairly complicated and technical. Um, and that's where I think these days, at least most of the battle has been around whether or not the cable companies and telephone companies as broadband providers can provide these sort of prioritized services to end users. Um, but as you say, I mean, the concept basically uh, is, is one that I think that, you know, most of the controversy has, has gone out of it. It's really coming down to this, this question of, of the, the business models that the broadband providers can play. And more or less, that's because the U.S. isn't willing to invest the money in the infrastructure that we all freaking know we need, and they want to try to outsource that to corporations. I mean, I mean, irony you see, alert, irony alert. Yeah. Irony yeah. Alert. I know, right? So you want to outsource that to someone who clearly doesn't have the best interest at heart. That that's more or less the the nuts and bolts of it. And Republican senators, congressmen, et cetera, being paid large amounts of money by telecom industries in terms of campaign contributions. Yeah, you know, and to be fair to them, you know, their perspective is uh, free market, right? So the less regulation, the better. And certainly I'm not somebody who believes you should be regulating just for the heck of it. But this seems to be a, a case where the incentives, the, the natural business incentives would, uh, would push the broadband providers to limit services, to degrade you know, some packets in order to prioritize other packets. Um, 
you know, which to, which to put some natural order of things in, in that business, in the business case. And so if, if that's the way it is, that to me is a, is a, a seminal, seminal example of where the government need, needs to step in really and, um, and ensure that, you know, end users are, are not being screwed over basically by their broadband providers. Oh, the mic is much better now. Suddenly we're loud and proud. I, it's, um, ah, awesome. <laughs> Just in time for me to say screwed over by the broadband providers. Exactly right. I, like, I, I would analogize it with, uh, with China's great firewall, to, to be honest. So you're either inside or outside of the firewall. If Facebook's paying 50 cents a user to be able to get quickly through to users and we have upstart competitor to Facebook that is not able to pay anything, ultimately, who is the cable company going to show you? Who are they going to zero rate, so to speak? It, it just is an incredibly slippery slope because telecom is a monopoly. And if you look at the industries that are the most monopolistic in terms of winner take all dynamics, those are the ones with the shittiest customer service because they don't have to care. That's why if any of you or if anyone's ever been on the phone with Comcast, or any of these I, cell phone providers are almost as bad. But if you're on the phone with them, you're on the phone forever and you hate the experience. Right. <laughs> Typically the broadband providers, you know, the cable companies, telcos are towards the bottom of the rankings of consumer you know, satisfaction. One little side note that's interesting is, is back in 2006, when I was consulting to Google, hadn't yet joined as a full-time employee, um, there was some internal discussion about whether Google should actually support net neutrality or whether, in fact, a non-neutral world was better for the company. Um, because even in those early days, they had the deep pockets. They could afford to pay off the broadband providers in order to ensure that people got rapid fire access to, um, you know, initially to, to search, but later on to YouTube and, of course, many other applications the company has on the web. Um, so, you know, there was that conversation and a recognition that you know, they and other larger entities could squeeze out their smaller competitors. Um, but the answer that came back pretty clearly from management was that's not the web that they know and trust and wanted their users to be able to have access to. Um, and so that was the decision that, that carried forward and, you know, remains the position of the company uh, more than a decade later. And yet, if you look today with GDPR and some of the other regulations, it is a lot like Facebook and Google are trying to pull up the ladder, so to speak, so the competitors can't get the data. Well, yeah, that's one of those really interesting conundrums. When you talk about um, regulation of large platform companies like a Google or a Facebook or a broadband provider or a telco, right? I mean, if you regulate, um, there's this danger that you are essentially going to freeze in place the existing business model. And around the edges, incrementally, you're probably affecting some behavior uh, and probably giving the user some tools and rights they wouldn't have had before. But by and large, you know, how much substantial change has happened with GDPR? Um, it's, you know, we're a year later and it's not entirely clear. And there is this argument that the larger providers, they've got, again, the deep pockets, they've got the resources for lobbying, they've got all the attorneys to write out all the agreements and all the interactions with end users. You know, they can figure this out. They can essentially game this to the extent that it's in their interest to do so. Smaller providers don't have nearly the same recourse. Um, so, uh, you know, GDPR, I think, was a great first step, my own perspective. But frankly, I think it's, it's only a first step. Um, and, you know, the, the, the need for regulation of things not just around data protection, but larger, I think, bigger societal issues around the use of AI, right? Um, and and uh, the coming of IoT and biometrics and all the other sort of next generation technologies, um, many of those things are not really going to be affected very much by GDPR. It's, it's more stuck in sort of an old style, you know, web consent based uh, framework, which again has some value, but I think for increasingly looking forward, it's not as future proof, I think, as many of us would, would prefer. How do we go about future-proofing that and improving the internet? Because politicians are inherently designed to be slow and have a, have a delay on the system, so to speak, so that they can't course correct too quickly and crash into a wall. Yeah, and that's you know, one of my jobs at Google. And, and frankly, one of the reasons I've, I left the company last year was I saw this really widening chasm between sort of the way Silicon Valley looks at things and the way that, let's just say DC, but that could be sort of a stand-in for all politicians around the world, right? Um, yeah, things here, you know, the credo until recently was, you know, move fast, break things, um, innovation, innovation at the yin-yang, um, and really a, a very libertarian, uh, you know, uh, attitude around uh, keeping government as far away as possible for 
you know, what you're trying to accomplish. Um, DC, again, is a stand-in for politicians everywhere, very, very different kind of a culture. I'd like to say they're the two most unreal places in the U.S. outside of Las Vegas. Um, you've got the politics bubble in D.C. 24 by 7, and here, you know, in Silicon Valley, it's the tech bubble 24 by 7, and they just don't talk well with each other. They're almost like two entirely different kinds of cultures. So I saw my role at Google, and now more recently doing some things with the Mozilla Foundation and the Georgetown Tech Law and Policy Institute as trying to serve a translation role. How do I try to help folks in D.C. understand um, the way the Valley is and how do I help the Valley folks appreciate that? Yeah, politics is slow and unwieldy and messy um, And uh, um, sometimes just you need to look away from it because it's just it's <laughs> it's a parade of horribles in terms of the sausage making process But at the end of the day it is you know It is for better or worse our democracy and it's the people there trying to do things uh, to uh, to the betterment of, of, of our citizens um, and I think the Valley to this point frankly has not taken the political world near, nearly seriously enough on its own terms. And the political world hasn't taken the valley seriously enough. Let's, let me play devil's advocate a little bit and float a theory sure. in front of you. I feel like you don't see this extreme divergence between the libertarian type technologists and the, the more social minded politicians in other countries. And I would argue it's because in the US, the government is probably the least competent in terms of the developed world. So people, I, I remember listening to a podcast one time. It was a Swedish entrepreneur. He'd been incredibly successful. And he was talking about paying a ton of taxes when he sold this billion dollar company or something. And he was thrilled with it because of what it, it meant for him and what it meant for the people around him. But I know I, as an American, hate paying taxes. And I imagine most Americans feel the same because we feel our government is, I mean, let, let's say you put money in and you get 25 cents out kind of efficient. Yeah, no, that's. I think that's absolutely right. There, there is that that attitude towards uh, what you know whether government will tax you fairly or whether regulations that are adopted are going to be uh, fair and implemented in you know in a, in a rational way. Um, you know, it's just there are different cultures here. Clearly, in Europe, they're they're more comfortable with government being more directly involved and more comfortable paying you know relatively higher portions in their taxes, and they gen generally seem to have a higher appreciation for what their government does. Um, that hasn't doesn't really carry over too much to the states, um, and I think that's unfortunate. Um, but it doesn't obviate the the necessity of the U.S. government to take very seriously what's happening in Silicon Valley. And even though it moves very fast and it's technically very challenging, particularly for some of the folks who've been up on the hill for a while, um, it's absolutely necessary to protect our interests as as U.S. citizens. What are the biggest internet ethics issues right now? Uh, ethics issues in terms of the companies themselves with the technologies. Um, I, yeah, I mean, so one thing that worries me, uh, there are a number of things that worry me on the ethics side, but one of them is where, frankly, uh, sort of looking at it from the other side of the coin, which is where government and corporations start to get a little too cozy with the technologies, right? Last year, Google had its, uh, the Project Maven, which was this notion of the, the, the contract with uh, the Pentagon um, for, to provide, uh, very advanced drone you know, uh, AIs that would allow for much more precise targeting um, of uh, the, the targets that, that the, uh, the, you know, the military were going after. I think in a, uh, if most of us would think, well, that's actually better, you're, you're trying to minimize collateral damage, you're trying to avoid having you know, bad outcomes in terms of civilians uh, being killed uh, in these attacks, but there are a lot of people saying, well, I don't trust my government. I don't trust that the U.S. military is going to use this technology in the right way. And at minimum, uh, I don't see the checks and balances to ensure that that kind of a sale initially won't go further to other types of technologies that are, that are more questionable. You've seen the similar things with facial recognition you know, going on in the city of San Francisco is the first in the nation um, to essentially ban its use um, on the government side. But it has nothing to do with what happens with facial recognition on the, on the company side and whether companies can do things in sort of private public partnerships where these kinds of, you know, biometric type technologies are deployed. So, you know, you see the worst of this, of course, in China, um, you know, with, the, with the, the social credit scoring system, but then also the surveillance regime that they've set up, you know, with some of their minority groups there. Um, to me, very worrisome that you've got some of the larger companies like Microsoft and Google with major AI um, facilities based right there in China to do sensibly doing research, but then how much of that research is spilling over 
to the government side where they can use it for their own purposes. So this whole notion of sort of, we look at the world as market and state and that's it, but I think uh, we're seeing, to me, some troubling signs where you know, there are interests on, on both of those sides of the supposed divide uh, to work together, where these technologies can be deployed in ways that may not be best for us as, as human beings. And this is the Bezos becomes president type dilemma that we find ourselves moving towards. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, Jeff has, Jeff has made his, uh, certainly has pitched his tent in Washington. Um, I don't know that um, any of the, t today, any of the tech CEOs are in a position to have the kind of political following that would get them into that. There was that position, rumor about Zuckerberg. That's the point. They don't need to. Right. Yeah. I mean, they, they, you know, they, if you have enough power in the marketplace, and which again spills over into obvious power in the political sphere, you don't have to be the one actually in charge. You don't have to be the face of whatever that power and control looks like. That can happen behind the scenes. Let's play devil's advocate. Do you think that traveling the world, traveling the U.S. state tour that Zuckerberg did, do you think that was for a potential run-up when he wanted to be president? Or do you think he knew about Cambridge Analytica ahead of time and was starting the apology tour? Yeah, it's hard for me to uh, sort of get inside of uh, Mr. Zuckerberg's brain. It, at the time, there were some rumors circulating around that he was at least tipping, you know, sticking his toe in the water to, to see about a bid. So it may have been that he had some genuine interest. Uh, and maybe from that tour, and certainly after Cambridge Analytica, he decided that was probably not, at least for now, uh, the best place for him to focus his his attention. Um, but yeah, hard to say. Um, but he is, you know, I, I give him credit the last three or four months. I think he's been quite savvy, even as Facebook continues to have issues, even as I think the moves, some of the moves he's making and what the company have been making are continue to be um, troubling. Um, he's out there, you know, he's the face of the company. He's talking about regulation. He's actually inviting regulation, which gets back to some of the challenges I mentioned previously about, okay, please come regulate me and, you know, turn me into a regulated monopoly. It's better than, better than, um, than some of the alternatives. Um, so, but you know, he's, he, he's, he's doing things and saying things to at least keep a conversation going. Um, and that's what a CEO is supposed to do. Um, and you can, you could argue that he, you know, you could argue with what he's saying and, and certainly many people have been, um, but at least he's, he seems to be stepping up to the challenge of, okay, I'm the head of this company and I have an obligation here to, you know, to talk to policymakers and, and figure out, you know, so, some things here that hopefully work, work for Facebook and, and work for, uh, you know, all of the, the billions of, of Facebook's users. He plays the, the ignorant CEO card well in terms of well intentioned, but history makes us at least need to question that which which tech monopoly are you most worried about and why tech monopoly in terms of a particular company or platform or technology in terms of company platform basically we've got the big four yeah you know uh the big it depends how you define it right i mean i think microsoft's made some great moves the last several years i think they you know to the point five or ten years ago they were basically an afterthought and now you know, in some ways, they've be, they've become a, a real leader on a lot of a lot of fronts. Um, I think between Facebook and Google, of the two, um, I'm I remain more concerned about Facebook, um, just because I think social and, and that the psychology behind social and all of the um, the basically all of the controls they've built into their system, um, I think are are. Uh, remain sort of uh, at the heart of what 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 is what is the problem with today's web um i think google you know with search and with what's going on with youtube and and some of the the various applications there you know i, I have definitely have concerns about my former employer um but um you know i think people treat search almost more like a utility where i think i think they otherwise they and, and amazon is now starting to eat into that in terms of on the retail side so that's going to be a really interesting battle there over the advertising piece of, of search and people sort of doing their retail business. Um, but the social part that, that Facebook has captured um, to many people, despite all of the problems, they can't break away from it. You know, their friends and family are there. They've, they've spent years building up contact lists, um, sharing their photos and data. And yeah, you could say move to somebody else, but sort of the network effects of that are just so pervasive um, that, uh, you know, I feel like they, they are probably have the cornerstone in terms of the, the single platform monopoly um, that I, you can see going in the foreseeable future. Not with the younger generations, at least, but then there's, 
Instagram. I still don't really understand how people use Instagram and get the same type of feel as like a Facebook type feel out of it. I feel like posting and commenting on pictures wouldn't be all that exciting, but maybe that's just me. Yeah, I've been told by my 23-year-old niece that I just don't know what I'm talking about when I say I don't understand Instagram. So, uh, you know, <laughs> I think it is a, a more of a younger generation thing. But, of course, you know, there's Facebook right there. And then they've got the, you know, the, the, the various IM applications as well that they're going to, it sounds like, put into this whole separate sort of private communications platform unto but, itself, yeah. which may allow more, quote, privacy on whatever terms you want to describe that, but also, again, gives them, uh, ultimately more control over that communications medium in a way that, frankly, a telephone company looking back the past hundred years would have, would have uh, massively envied. And of course you can't regulate it and break it up because suddenly it's all the same service. Yeah. And again, I, I, that's where I think Mark is, is playing this smartly to as, as they're moving, I think very quickly to try to consolidate all of that stuff. He's trying to point elsewhere in terms of the sort of the dumpster fires that Facebook has generated over the past couple of years. And, 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 I think trying to get people to focus more on what's going on there and, and allow him to proceed with the integration that he really wants. Is it possible to fix some of these problems without fixing the underlying advertising and surveillance capitalism business model that dominates the web? That's a great question. You know, Shoshana's book is, is wonderful in terms of the chapter and verse that she provides on really going back over the last decade and, and the whole ad tech and MarTech and some have called it now the mad tech <laughs> combination <laughs> um, uh, where basically every move you make in every, every situation and every environment is constantly scrutinized and made available for people to try to sell you stuff. Um, I do think that is the underlying problem that that is, that is the, and that's why I also believe the, you know, the calls to, for example, let's break up, you know, Google, let's break up Facebook. But the problem is you're not breaking up the underlying incentive structure. So yeah, the network effects temporarily might, might sort of push down some of the piece parts, but there'll be another generation of, of uh, entities rising in their wake. And those very entities are going to be, um, you know, operating under the exact same incentive structures where you've got all the, you know, thousands and thousands of these data brokers um, out there and, you know, entire uh, ecosystems built up around this basic notion of getting access to personal data and to turn it into advertising and marketing. Um, so I think that is, that is the problem. And it is the, you know, it's also sort of the undermining of the concept of a multi-sided platform, right? This goes back in economics, a number of, of decades. Um, Gene Troll, who won the Nobel Prize for economics, I think actually sort of coined the phrase and did some of the early analysis. And on, in theory, multi-sided platforms work really well, right? You've got users on one side, users on another side, and the platform comes in and provides some sort of a bridging functionality that allows both sides to connect, to transact, and to gain benefit from the overall situation. But the problem with the platforms we have today is that the one side really is the client base. That's the data broker side. They are the true customers and clients of all of this. They are the subjects of the relationship. Whereas we, the end users who are providing the data inputs into the platform have become the objects. And so in where theoretically, at least there is some sort of a balance. My perspective at least is that that balance has seriously been skewed, particularly over the last five or 10 years. And so unless there's a way to, to structurally functionally change that dynamic, um, that's going to be the dynamic going forward, whether it's Google or Facebook or many other you know, companies who, who want to try to take their place in, in the web. And then there's the flip side, Amazon making their own products, Apple having their own apps, Facebook kicking off the whatever games with friends or whatever. Basically, the fact that they can create their own little kingdom within their kingdom to essentially monopolize everyone else out of the equation. Yeah, so that is that is an interesting sort of reaction from the platform company side. Um, and, it, you know, I called it a dumpster fire earlier. I think it really is the case. There's so many problems now that they, are, that they have created in terms of this, this sort of asymmetry and in terms of sort of letting loose all these various forces that are intended to just maximize, uh, you know, the user's uh, attention span um, on the web to, to gain more personal data from them. I think they're realizing on their own side that they need to change change the game up a bit to to give themselves more control. But the problem is, it is more control that's basically building these walled gardens, and they will they will be in the middle of all of that. 
Um, and the so-called open web that many of us still believe, you know, has some, has some value and, and virtue to it, um, will sort of recede into the background because it will be three, four, five, you know, mega Walt Garden type approaches where they control end to end everything that happens. Uh, and there'll still be the same pervasive incentives to maximize, you know, access to your personal data for purposes of, of, of selling stuff. Um, but um, they'll, be, they'll be able to say, okay, we're minimizing concerns around, for example, trolls and hate speech and misinformation and a lot of the sort of Section 230 intermediary you know, content liability stuff um, where they've been particularly getting hammered by, you know, by the press and by politicians. We have a garden of, garden of Eden for the hippies, a garden of Eden for the Nazis. They each get their own. We don't have to send them to the same place and we can make tons of money doing it. Yeah, and you could you can wash your hands of of any you know culpability for that, right? Because hey, I'm not monitoring what's going on. It's just a private feed between you know a couple of neo-Nazi groups. So uh, I, you know I have I have no involvement there, and uh, also puts more of the onus then on government to try to figure out how do you break into some of those uh, really nasty um, you know groups. Do you think there'll be international regulations, or is it going to just be something where Europe leads the way and? inevitably I kind of like the system they have of we're going to make this rule and we're going to backdate it so we can charge you lots of fees because it is the right thing and we also need the money and you've been hiding it here now the <laughs> the kind of way they do it is totally wrong the motivation is totally right and they kind of end up winning and benefiting from it do we see that happening more and more around the world yeah, so I, I do think an international regime is is pretty much impossible at this point. There, there, you may figure out some very baseline stuff, but um, anything, particularly anything that's enforceable, I think it's just not going to happen. So you could have the United Nations, for example, issue some really, you know, salutary language around you know protecting privacy and human autonomy, et cetera. But um, unless there's actually some accountability and enforcement built into that it's hard to see that really doing much of anything so i think for at least for now the pattern will continue that europe leads maybe some other nations you know india is an interesting possibility particularly now that Modi's been reelected. um you know we're going to start to see more of this sort of uh you know nationalism driven uh, approaches uh where the big bad tech companies need to be brought Brought under heel, heel, um, uh, fine signs of those national treasuries, treasuries. <laughs> um, um, and, and, and owning the fact, fact that they just can't, just can't get local businesses and start start taking Hey, Richard, let me cut you off for a sec. Your mic yeah, is going, yeah. your mic is going nuts. Um, oh, try, right. try unplugging and replugging the mic, and if that doesn't work, we'll stop. Okay, okay. Gaspar, just cut this part out in the editing, okay? Thanks. Okay. Okay. Is that any better? Oh yeah, that's way better. You were you were kind of like Arnold from the Terminator, like. <laughs> okay, so we'll cut that part out right there. Let's, okay. um, what's that last question? Let's just try to refix that one. Um, do you remember? It was about different approaches. Um, is there a chance of international regulation? Okay. Do you want to just take that one from the top? Sure. Yeah, so you know, I think that the prospects of international regulation are quite low. Uh, you just can't find unanimity of opinion uh, around the world. Europe and the U.S. Uh, currently are on very different paths. Uh, the Europeans uh, have, through a combination of setting up things like GDPR, but also their e-privacy initiative, e-commerce initiatives, uh, and then a series of investigations by some of the regulators in some of the countries. Have, I think successfully gotten the attention finally of the platform providers. Um, I think a company, or excuse me, a country like India is interesting now that Modi's been reelected. I think there's been some talk around there that they might try to do something to be tougher, uh, perhaps imposing sanctions on the platform companies. Um, and I think, you know, if you look at internationally, the United Nations, um, you know, is certainly a place where some solitary language could be developed around, you know, protecting autonomy and privacy. Um, maybe consistent with the International Human Rights Convention, but none of that is enforceable, right, ultimately. So it really comes down to who has the teeth to take on the platform companies. And right now, it's largely been Europe with the U.S. potentially getting into the game if they can finally get something through Congress this year. So then we throw IoT into the mix and everything just goes hell in a handbasket further. What, what are some of the implications of where we're headed, where you see us headed, and what you're worried about? 
Yeah, so I think IoT, and actually I, I you know, wrote a few articles about it going back a few years now where it, it seemed like it was gonna be a really interesting dynamic that you can start to take your online presence into the offline world. Um, and I think in terms of industrial applications, agricultural applications, a lot of things around geospatial um, recognition and um, using sensors as ways to detect and interact with uh, and assess the environment, um, I think IoT is a pretty amazing thing. And I think once we get 5G spectrum out there um, and probably some more uh, Wi-Fi and other unlicensed spectrum, you really have the connectivity capability along with edge computing to really have a very dense uh, infrastructure of IoT uh, devices and sensors for all those, those kinds of applications. My concern, um, as always, is what it means for the average person. And, um, you know, we've seen, I think, the drone, uh, having drones over the past couple of years, first as a hobby, but increasingly you're starting to see drones used in other ways, um, is, as I think, the, the forefront of this. You know, who, a drone comes, this, for example, and hovers by your window. Who, who owns it? Who controls it? Um, is there an obligation to identify themselves by external markings, by identify whether or not they're recording you, um, or otherwise using you know, their sensors in ways to detect and get some sort of information off of you, off of your family. Um, that's, again, just the precursor. You're seeing increasingly the other uses of, of some of the biometric technologies, facial recognition and the like, uh, even detecting heartbeats and emotion senses and the like, and those kinds of things. Um, so as you get all those sensors out in the environment, whether it's drones or just a camera following you as I walk down the street and, and, and uh, you know, go to the bar, my favorite bar stool, um, you know, I think that's where the creepiness factor for many, uh, at least for many Americans, may start to, to, to finally hit home, right? The, to the extent surveillance online has been part of sort of this uneasy acceptance, the norm that you're not really thrilled with, but you get some free cat videos, so what the hell? But I think when you start seeing these devices, particularly not in the hands of government, but in the hands of corporations, um, you know, the private sector basically using as ways to collect ever more personal data about myself, my children, my, my spouse, my friends and, and neighborhood, um, I, I, I think that is where many of these sort of really uh, difficult ethical uh, issues will, will come to the forefront. We need to have a good open source solution. I hear people having Alexas and Google Homes and then the law enforcement going and um, whatever the term, getting warrants to pull all essentially information. Essentially, they get free wiretapped because they find out, oh, wow, there was something here listening the whole time. We might as well take that. Yeah, I think there actually was a case within the last year where there was a murder committed in a home. And uh, the device, I'm, I don't remember if it was Alexa or Siri or Google Assistant, but it was on it and it was actually on and active at the time. And so they were able to go back and, and use a warrant and get information from the company, whichever it was involved, um, to, to get more information on what actually happened in the home that day. And that's the scary thing about government because it will take any power that it's able to take. How do yeah, ordinary you know, citizens fight that? That is, that is certainly a concern uh, without the appropriate checks and balances and being a lawyer and understanding something of, of our U.S. Constitution, um, you know, that's the way it's been established. And in that case, for example, if there was an actual search warrant that was sworn out and the judge approved it and went through the appropriate channels and procedures, then, you know, one is to say, good, that's the way it's supposed to work. And if you actually then apprehended somebody who was guilty of a crime, then that's also the way it should work. The concern is when it starts going outside of channels, like it certainly at post 9-11, when there were a lot of things that were done in the name of national security um, that either didn't live up to the law or the laws then were changed, <laughs> modified um, to allow certain behaviors to, in, in, including things like surveillance and wiretapping uh, to be made lawful. Um, so yeah, you, you'd like to think in a, in a democracy, the government is always on your side, but that's clearly not always the case. Yeah, national, um, national security is kind of like the Obi-Wan Kenobi. These are not the droids you seek. You get to kind of have a blanket pass on whatever you want it to be a blanket pass for. What do you, what do you think about, so, oh, what was that? Oh, yes, 5G, Huawei. What do you think about this whole showdown, so to speak, that's happening now? Trump just put Huawei on the essentially terrorist, let's not ever work with these guys again and destroy the entire business list. How do you think about what's developing between the US and China? Because I'm worried. 
yeah, and then Google, you know, shortly thereafter said, okay, we're going to, you know, stop doing business with Huawei, which really helped sort of tank the company stock and, and drew a lot of attention to their, 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 the challenges they now face. You know, Huawei for years has been one of those, the Chinese companies that has attracted a lot of rumors. When I was even back in D.C., um, they were always viewed as, as suspect, right, as because, oh, of course, they have some direct ties to the Chinese government and to the Chinese national security interests and, and police and all that, and so you can't trust them. Um, and yet Huawei was tended to be one of the cheaper suppliers of uh, telecommunications equipment so to the and uh, to the world and so you know even with that you know the, the statement that came down from the Trump administration last week um, there's a lot of Huawei equipment all over the place right, in the US infrastructure right in in you know on the mobile side but also on, on the uh, sort of the last mile access side um, and so it's a, it is a bit worrisome to the extent that there is concern that they actually do have those ties, um, that, you know, they, there already are, is some equipment in place that potentially could be used, uh, you know, used as part of their surveillance regime. I was actually less worried about that. So I was listening to, I listened to an interview with Trump where he was explaining how bad and why they're bad and bad and dangerous, but they used those words a couple of times, but in terms of, how the interview sounded and how it went a couple of times he brought up, but if we have a trade agreement, maybe we could list them as one of the ones we could exclude some of these extra issues type deals. But my understanding and the reason why I'm worried about it is from what I've heard being placed on whatever the name of this list is, I'm not sure the name of this list. It's essentially a terrorist type watch list, which means yeah, that yeah. no U S companies are the equipment watch list. Of something yeah. Like so no U.S. companies are able to do business with them and no companies that do business with U.S. companies, I believe, are able to do business. So they can't get their ARM processors. They essentially can't get any first world modern technology, which, which would more or less crush and probably bankrupt the company very, very quickly. Is this something that China wouldn't retaliate and have similar sanctions against U.S. companies, which would crush and destroy US companies because Apple's warehouses and supply chain is over in China and everyone's everything is manufactured over in China. If they, if they play tit for tat, then eventually we're all screwed. Yeah, and you know, this kind of brinksmanship, you know, again, from my perspective is, is, is rarely helpful. Um, again, because Huawei has had these concerns for a while, there could have been some sort of a gradual escalation um, around the concerns around Huawei, but the fact it came out so quickly and as no it was proof. offered up so easily by the president as a, as a potential trading chip um, suggests that it could well be, which is, you know, that, that's pretty, that, that's not, I don't, that is not the way when I took international trade uh, in law school, but that's not the way it's supposed to work. Um, first off, if they're legitimate business um, and they have legitimate purposes to be doing their business, they should be allowed to do so. If not, they should not. It's just fairly black and white, and and to say, well, they're pretty bad people. But you know, if we get a trade deal, we can maybe let them back into the country. Um, you know, that that's worrisome. And on the Chinese end, as you said, you know, the, the Chinese government could certainly interpret this as a, basically a low-level de declaration of war, uh, because we are trying to, you know, you know, perhaps put one of their major companies out of business, or at least really you know, direct their their near-term future. Um, so they could take retaliatory steps against Apple or, frankly, many of the companies that are tech companies that are in, in operating in China you know, out of the U.S. They almost have to because if they don't, let, let's play devil's advocate again. If they don't, they're implying that they're guilty. If they, and if they don't, the company goes under, which crushes tons of China's economy, both globally and locally. In, in a lot of ways you kind of have to punch back if the bully punches you in the stomach because otherwise you're going to get the next foot. Yeah. I, I feel like it could easily spiral into an economic or political slash, I mean, if you want to get real, real dark, nuclear war very quickly because you're going after someone's most valuable bits, so to speak. I mean, if Apple and suddenly Google and suddenly Microsoft, all of their businesses collapsed overnight, what does the U.S. look like? Yeah, and, you know, Huawei put out some brave statements after being put on the watch list that they had, you know, enough supplies in hand and they had already made sort of alternative business, you know, um, plans uh, to, to deal with this kind of eventuality. 
um, which is also both interesting that they knew that they were on thin ice already, maybe legitimately. Um, but yeah, no, I, you know, as I say, these, these things rarely go well when, when they're in, in, the, in the current situation where, you know, we already have not great relationships with the Chinese government has become, there's a major trade war going on. Um, it can be quickly, quickly become a matter of my pawn versus your knight versus my king, and it can get out of hand really fast. I mean, regardless of what happens, it accelerates the closed internet architecture of a splintering between, at the very least, east and west, possibly more. Yeah, and I think that splinter net has, has been in place, unfortunately, has been in place for a while, and I think it's only accelerating. And, you know, ironically, U.S. companies who have long favored the open web are some of the ones now taking the next steps toward creating the splinter nets. And this is, you know, for example, with the Facebook potential new business model. Um, and Amazon, of course, and, and Apple already have, in a sense, their own sort of splinter nets. Um, so, um, yeah, it, it's, it's not a great thing for those who, who believe there should be sort of a single World Wide Web accessible for everybody. So we've done some major Debbie Downers. What are you optimistic and excited about these days? <laughs> Which technologies and trends have you all up and happy? Well, this may be the time to talk about my little project. So, um, you know, when I left Google last May and joined Mozilla uh, as a fellow in their, in their foundation, um, I was trying to figure out, you know, I, I understood, I think I understand many of the structural challenges that the web faces today, many of the behaviors and actions of companies like Facebook and Google that have been detrimental um, to the open web. And as talking to some of the leadership at Mozilla, I, I was, uh, you know, sort of grappling with where do we go from here? And so it's, it's one thing to say, yeah, here are all some of these you know, parade of horribles of all this terrible stuff that's going on. But then how do we improve it? How do we actually change it in a very fundamental and positive way? And so I came up with this, this thing that which I call Gleanet, um, which is a project um, intended to bring back, ironically, uh, trusted intermediaries into the mix, uh, for the, you know, which we had back in the day, right before we decided to dis disintermediate half the world. So it's, the notion is what I call old rules and, and, and new tools. So the old rules meaning basically, let's develop actual client relationships between end users and entities uh, that, are, that are accountable and trustworthy and using fiduciary obligations, the basic duties of care, duties of loyalty, which we have today with, with um, you know, folks like doctors and lawyers and certain kinds of financial advisors. Um, and that's the old school way that Adam Smith thought about the markets back, you know, back in the 18th century. And so, uh, you know, we have the web, ironically, for all of its success that the platform companies have brought to many people, it has really gotten away from that. As I mentioned earlier, the, the dynamics of platforms is so skewed now between users on one side and the data brokers on the other, that uh, the platform has really become an impediment to giving users their own, their own optionality. And so the idea is to, to have trusted intermediaries brought into, into the equation and then arming end users with the technology tools themselves. I think the best example is AI, right? We have the AIs in our living room, sitting on our devices, the AI is making decisions for us in, you know, on YouTube of what's the next video to, to watch, et cetera. And that's only getting more uh, sophisticated and advanced, and, but it's also taking more and more control and autonomy away from the end user. Uh, and so the one, you know, one trend I've been seeing in the Valley, it's a small one, but I think it's encouraging, is the notion of creating personal AIs, right? Each one of us having our own essentially avatar representing our interests, it's, uh, it sits on my phone and that can interact directly with other AIs and in a real time basis, because the cognitive overload is much more than any of us could probably deal with, you can have these sort of real time machine based conversations over whether or not it gets access to that Wi-Fi or whether or not it gets access to my personal data profile for whatever purposes. And so it creates a new dynamic, a market-based dynamic between myself and other you know, platform functionalities, whether it's AI, whether it's identity layers, whether it's modular devices. Um, there's there's a, a number of ways you can look at all the different uh, tools that could be available to end users but are locked up essentially within the platform companies and other large companies. Uh, where, uh, you know, we now can actually become a part of that game. And I like to say there's an arms race going on, except all the arms are on one side. And so let's, let's actually, let's create a little escalation here. Let's put the end user as not just an end user, but now as a client and a customer and having somebody operating for the first time as their legitimate authorized agent, agent in the web. 
I'm going to need way more brush strokes to understand exactly what's happening here. <laughs> is this blockchain? What's is how how exactly do you envision it? And let's come up with a couple of examples. Yeah, so blockchain could be part of it. <laughs> I mean, that's it's blockchain is, but so let's just for starters, let's let's think of are there institutions today that you trust? So let so right now in the web we we basically have the technology companies who give us the technologies that we use, right? Um, and then we're told to trust them. And that's not the way most markets work. Most markets operate under a sense of initially, okay, how trustworthy do I find you as somebody that I might want to transact some business with or have it at some sort of interaction with? Um, and so why not start with the trust levels in society today and then you can layer the tech on top of that. That's actually the easy part in a sense. There's tons of people in the Valley who would love to sell their tech into entities who then will, will deploy them and work with you to actually, you know, have them become part of your, your everyday repertoire. Um, but, you know, you got to start with the trust first. And so, you know, what are the trusted institutions? Many of them are what I call the digital left behinds, right? So news organizations um, are good, you know, one good example of a type of entity that is desperately looking for a business model, uh, and yet they have millions of subscribers in some cases uh, who like what they do generally, um, generally get fairly high marks uh, from the people who subscribe to their services. Um, they could be a really interesting type of intermediary in, in one's life. So let's say The Guardian, let's use The Guardian as an example. If that's a, a news organization that will say, you know, I like them, I give them money every year, I think they do a good job. Well, they could become my intermediary. They would be the ones who would work with me. There's an actual agreement between us where I give them access to my data on whatever terms I feel comfortable with. And they essentially become the protectors and guarantors of access to my data through them. They are the one and only trusted portal that then in turn interacts with the rest of the web on, on my behalf. And then they also work with me to give me these various tools I'm talking about, like personalized AIs. Um, creating identity layers using things like zero proof knowledge algorithms and fancy stuff, but eventually giving me the power over my relationship with the web rather than being the mere passive user that I've become for the past 20 years. Isn't it problematic though, because the guardian has no tech skills. Isn't that a big part of the, the issue, so to speak, is the companies that have the tech skills can do this and the ones that don't can't. I, I'm, I'm kind of envisioning like a personalized I'm kind of envisioning like a personalized butler or a, a mobile app, a mobile wallet that has a bunch of different credit cards and is helping me choose which credit card to use for which, which purchase. But would, then, would we then need to create new platforms, apps, et cetera, for all of these little AI butlers to be able to pick and choose between, let's see, I'll take a little bit of the, the Facebook with the Instagram image sharing yeah, so, so it starts out the basics, the very basics of why, what would make the web experience better for me. If somebody could actually control all my passwords for me for all the websites I go to and never make me have to sign in ever again, that would be great. Obviously, that's available through Google and some other places, but this would be available through somebody that I actually have a direct relationship with. And if they screw it up, I can sue them, <laughs> right? There's actual legal privity there is sort of the concept that, you know, that I, I think works. Um, and then they can look at all the other things that they could do for you. They could have the, the wallet, the digital wallet for you, right? They could put in a new browser, right? Brave's a great browser, right, as an example. But really, except for the Cognizante and early adopters and a few tech geeks here and there, they don't have a lot of traction in the marketplace. But if we create an ecosystem where Brave becomes one of like the selected browsers that users can utilize, and then they can throw in some DuckDuckGo and whatever, maybe they can use Tim Burley's Solid, now you've got a real sort of marketplace of all of these things available that then the user can, can provide. And now you can start creating network effects around that. So rather than one at a time users coming to go use Brave, for example, um, you know, overnight maybe 20 million people go to do that through The Guardian, or 30 million people go to do that through AARP, or 50 million people go to do that through their local public libraries. It's a matter of finding the intermediaries who want to become more relevant in the digital space and where people have some level of trust. And then there are tons of people in the Valley and elsewhere who would be happy to work with them to layer on the technologies on top of that. Understood. <laughs> Somewhat understood.
Yeah, it's, it's a uh, challenging thing because it's basically building a new ecosystem on, on the web. It's a new kind of platform and a new ecosystem. So it sounds daunting and a little immodest, but I feel like that's the kind of structural change we need to make to put us as end users, as human beings, back in the driver's seat. And we have intermediaries because human beings aren't able or willing to take control of all of those separate aspects on their own. We'd much rather delegate to get the ease of use. Well, some could, right? This, this kind of configuration certainly allows people to take on as much or as little of that that they want to. But the, I think the, the assumption is for the majority of people, uh, certainly developing and the, the developed world, um, you know, they're too busy, they're too, you know, they, they, they don't have the technical know-how. Um, and some of them also don't really see the value. That's been one of, the, one of the challenges is that there is no alternative ecosystem today. It's like, you know, use, use okay, I'm going to leave Facebook. Okay, great, leave Facebook. Where do I go? What are my alternatives? And you have to go out there and hunt around and try to figure out what is some other way that I could create like another Facebook. And it puts too much onus, frankly, on ordinary people to go do that. So if we actually create an ecosystem and says, hey, this is the trusted place to go. Here are 17 different Facebook alternatives. Have at it. Um, you know, here are seven ty types of browsers that do a much better job controlling and, you know, your data on your behalf. Here's some ads-free stuff you can utilize. Um, you know, I see this with Mozilla, for example. Mozilla has the browser, right? Firefox, which is which is successful in its own terms, but it's about you know 10 or 12 percent of the population, and it's been pretty consistently at that level. And a part of the challenge is that because, you know, they say, oh, great, here's your new add-on to, to block ads, or here's this or that. And I think for many people, it's like, whoa, dude, I just, you know, I just want it to work. And I want to protect myself and my family and promote my own interests on the web. So can't you help me do that? And that's where I think having an actual entity in there actively engaged um, you know, can, can make a difference. I got you. So it would be like a Captera that you pay for that manages things for you. So rather than giving you the best recommendations. It says, here's the best two options, pick one, we'll run it. Something like that, yeah, yeah. And it also, I think among other things, it's an interesting way to perhaps change the ads economy. We're not gonna, we're not gonna get away from advertising. You know, It's been around for hundreds of years, but why not make advertising more relevant to people if the ads are managed for you by this intermediary? And for example, if I say, I wanna go to Hawaii next month with my family for five nights, um, the intermediary says, great, we're going to go out on the web and we're going to go look for the best possible deals. I think the notion is called intent casting, right? It's like, put your intentions out there, except we're going to give only as much information as you feel comfortable with in that transaction. So you're a family of four, you have the wherewithal for this, here's your expectations. What can the web sort of do for me? And so there's minimal amount of data that's left out there. The intention, you know, hopefully cast out there brings back some offers. There's a negotiation and you settle on something and that, that advertiser or that marketer, that retailer, whoever it is, boom, they knew exactly what made for a sale for them. That's great. There's, that's, that is a direct, uh, you know, an impactful um, transaction from their perspective. It's very, uh, very much a relevant one from your perspective. And so maybe you actually create a race to the top in terms of more relevant advertising that people want to utilize because it gets them what they need and they get you know, valid offers from the other side. So that's one way also to think about, you know, keeping ads around, uh, which is the bane of many of our existences, but maybe there's a ways to refashion it so it becomes a better, a better deal for everybody. There is. It's kind of dangerous, though, because we're already at peak production and consumption. And if we just make the ads better, we're just up in consumption in all likelihood. Well, but then, it, you know, right now, the problem, I think, in part is that the consumption is sort of forced on us. You know, you, you, if you're constantly enticed with all of these ads and all of these offers for things, many of them you don't need or don't want or can't afford, maybe if you have a little intentionality built into that, so you're the one making the decision, sort of like you're the one who's walking into the mall actively deciding to buy a shirt rather than have a million shirts following you around for three months on the web. Um, you know, maybe that changes that dynamic a bit. Maybe you can also, through your intermediary, you know, it can help you. It's like, hey, dude, I'm on a budget. I can't go over more than this. You know, work with me. Uh, and so it can actually you know, do some sort of interesting pushes and pulls and, and, and nudges um, to put you sort of on, on the right path. Again, in ways that are totally consistent with the way you want it to program it that way, as opposed to somebody else deciding it's in your best interest. What's the most interesting technology startup or idea you've heard in the past week or two? Wow, in the past week or two. Um, well, I think some of the stuff that's going on in the AI space with what I call this, the, 
I think Apple's been investing in it, right? But it's um, it's sort of on device, off cloud AI, um, which, and, and Google mentioned this at the IO conference about three weeks ago. It's the notion that you can take all of that vast intelligence, machine learning based algorithmic systems that you know, Google and others are perfecting and basically jam it down into a bite-sized chunk on your mobile device. And that it has enough capability, enough intelligence residing on the device that it doesn't need to constantly ping the web, that it can actually be there and you can actually keep more of the data than on the device itself. So Google has its own reasons for wanting to do that. I think it's basically to be able to surveil us more often uh, in places where there's no Wi-Fi, for example. Um, but from the user side, that creates the really interesting option of saying, hey, wait a minute, the data is on my side, the intelligence is on my side. Why do I have to live in a world where my stuff's sitting on a server farm someplace waiting to be hacked into? So I think that kind of functionality, and there are a few companies who have been doing some of that work uh, in the Valley. The one that I was familiar with was Silk Labs, which Apple recently bought. Um, that, that functionality in the right hands could become a user empowerment tool, not another, not, not yet another user surveillance tool, which is, I think, the way some of the platform companies would prefer to see it. Well, technology is a double-edged sword. It just depends on which edge you get. That is basically it. And my point is we've been getting the wrong side of the sword for too long. So, you know, why not, why not empower us to, you know, to start making our own decisions using a trusted entity uh, in the middle to, to work with us. I would agree. And I would say that for a lot of people, they would think about Apple in that role. But I think that that's very false in terms of a dichotomy because they're slowing down your iPhone when they launch a new one. They're taking out all the ports. So you have to buy new adapters for the ports. They're not really looking out for you. They're kind of looking out for you where it helps them to look out for them. And I'm not sure how you get around something like that in terms of that non-fiduciary, but kind of pretending like we're a fiduciary responsibility. No one, no one really trusts Facebook or Google, but they also don't not trust them enough. But a company like Apple, well, yeah, I trust Apple, right? I'm gonna go wait outside in a long line to buy my XYZ, but. Yeah, well, part of the problem is Apple also is tends to be for the high-end consumers, right? So uh, a lot of folks in this country you know, can't afford an iPhone or they buy one anyway, even if they really can't afford it. Um, and, and yeah, they're better on privacy, but they still use that data in ways that further their interests uh, solely over yours. Um, and so, and they're also, because they are more of a walled garden, um, they're less, they work less well with the wide open web. So ideally you want an entity there that will be very tight in terms of helping you control your data and computational resources and keeping that local and under your control but then also at the same time being your window into the rest of the web and giving you maximum exposure to the extent you want to under sort of protected terms so you benefit from the give and take of, of the web. Does it need to be open source for it to work sustainably long-term without just leading to this issue? Yeah, I think that would be the ideal way to do this. And frankly, if you're going to have you know, required interfaces, for example, between my personal AI and let's say Siri um, or Google Assistant or Alexa, there'll need to be some common standards there and protocols, et cetera. I think all that should be developed as part of the open source community and, and work its way through the industry standards bodies um, in the appropriate, you know, the appropriate course. And let's face it, no one wants to use Siri. Um, but just to, <laughs> just to, to start wrapping things uh, up. Yeah, it's, it has not been the, the, the fulsome success I think Apple would hope for. I think it would have been, but they kind of rested on their laurels, so to speak. Hey, uh, let's create something and then just let it be for, 10 years and hope no one catches up. It's, uh, it's not always the best of approaches. Where, if you had to point to one trend that we haven't talked about yet today that you're most worried about, what would it be and why? Well, another part of the sort of cabal of companies. So you look at things like AI, we've talked about IoT. Another interesting but potentially troubling one is AR, right? Augmented reality, also mixed reality, virtual reality. But it's, you know, this notion of creating this other world. And Kevin Kelly uh, wrote, I think, a really interesting piece just a month or two ago in Wired Magazine, um, in which he, he used the term mirror world. Uh, and this notion that basically every bit will have an atom and every atom will have a bit. Um, and you know, this, this entirely brand new spanking world, virtual world, um, will be created, which on the one hand sounds awesome, 
and sounds like like the gaming experience of a lifetime to be living in every day. But on the other hand, again, who ultimately controls that? Who's going to be the one in charge of it? Uh, your, whether it's your exposure to what you're doing in that environment, you know, one example, who owns my house in a virtual world? Somebody comes along with spray paints, Nazi graffiti on it. All right. Who's in charge of that? I don't know. Somebody comes and uses AR as a way to harass my seven-year-old daughter. You know, that's really not good. So, and we talked earlier about the political world, you know, they're going to be really slow to catch up to this stuff. And in the meantime, I think that there's some potentially real societal damage that could be caused if these kinds of technologies are deployed in ways that, that are not human centric and did not let the quote end user, you know, be in charge of their experiences. So I would say, yeah, augmented reality over the next, you know, two, three, five years as it's deployed, I worry about the impact it's going to have w without the appropriate measures in place on the company's side um, and perhaps the need for some government oversight. And that's without even talking about the getting deeper into the loneliness into the screen type effect that we've been seeing just with phones themselves. Yeah, you know, many, many people use augmented reality today um, as a way to sort of escape from the world. <laughs> and this becomes a place where the world follows you into, into that escape. Um, you know, and there are psychological issues, you know, Tristan Harris has been talking about this and many others about, um, you know, how technology, there may be some inherent challenges with technology, just not even in terms of control by particular um, you know, players in a marketplace environment, but really how it impacts us day to day on a psychological basis in terms of addiction, in, in terms of uh, a feeding into perhaps some of the negative side of some of our psychologies. When you have things like AR layered on top of that, aren't you in some ways deepening uh, some of those challenges or some of those problems without offering any obvious solutions? For anyone who's had a baby, you know, they see a screen and can't look away because of the extra stimulation of that brightness. And that in and of itself is hardwired into all of us to seek that stimulation. It's, it's incredibly dangerous. It's incredibly problematic going forward. I, um, if anyone doesn't have flux on their computer, if anyone hasn't turned down the screen brightness and changed some <laughs> of those things, you will never go back. So I highly, highly recommend that. Very cool. and, yeah. In I also terms of throwing their nat natural language processing, right? So more of this, I mean, this, you just say the screen is, it just sucks us in. It's just the way we're, we've evolved. But then we're also now moving to the sort of the smart agents world where everything will be, you know, language prompts. And you know, it's very easy just to say, you know, lie in bed, and say, oh, yeah, you know, see me, just send me that pizza, I'm ready for that. Um, so, you know, it, it, it lowers the barrier further in terms of our interfaces with the technology world. And I don't want to sort of make this all a bad thing. This is not all, you know, dark mirror. There, there's really good stuff happening here as well. I'm sorry, black mirror. But, um, but it's, you know, but it also can go very wrong if we don't use it in ways that, that human beings are always the, the forefront of our considerations. Yeah, we're all too happy as a species to walk into McDonald's and grab something easy. And that's been very yeah. problematic and is getting even more problematic. So we, we've got to think about technology just like we do our fast food. We've got to think about it fast and probably regulate it. I got one last question for you, Richard. If you had to leave people with one thing, a quote, a call to action, it can be anything before you tell them a little bit more about you and where to find you, what would it be and why? Well, uh, the website is glia.net, and it's G-L-I-A, it's the Greek word for glue. So the notion of we need more of the trust, the trusted relationships, you know, glue, that's the glue that binds us together. It creates accountability between power and responsibility. Um, it's also the glial cells in the brain, which support the neurons. And I, I would say that we need a few more glial cells in the valley and a few fewer neural, neural structures, perhaps. Um, but yeah, I mean, come to the website and, and learn more about what I'm doing with the GliaNet project. And just think about, you know, this is the world of the web is just so new, right? We, it's almost like this, this notion that, ah, what's happened over the past 5, 10, 20 years was just inevitable. It's going to always turn out this way. And now we're stuck in it and there's not much we can do. We just happened to take one of the many byways that was available to us. There are many other things we can be doing and exploring today. So don't accept the status quo um, as, as the one and true answer. There's many other things we could be exploring together. Um, and I hope, you know, people, whether it's through Glianet or many other things they can do in their daily lives, make technology on their, put it on their side. As Doc Searle says, uh, don't be the pinball, be the machine.
Oh, that's a great quote. Yeah, people walk into the future backwards and assume the future will always look the same as the past, and it doesn't. <laughs> Things need to change, and if you don't change them, then eventually you trip. It's uh, it's very problematic. Thanks, uh, thanks for coming today, Richard. This has been this has been a lot of fun. Cool. Uh, I appreciate it, Matt. Thanks so much for having me on the show. And guys, if you're listening and love the disruptors, we're seeking now some new sponsors. So if you've got a company or product that let's face it, you're reputable, fit along with what our focus for the show is and are interested in reaching out and possibly advertising, matt at disruptors.fm. And now go get back to doing something awesome and changing the world. Same with you, Richard. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Sweet. That was good. Cool. Thank you. <laughs>